Mm. And good evening and welcome back to Continual. It is another edition of Hot Off the Press. I'm Jim Nettles. I'll be your host and moderator this evening. I have with me the one and only Samantha Bryant and Les Gould. We have a lot of trouble to cause tonight. So um, I'll let you guys go through, introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. So Samantha, ladies first. All right. So hi, I'm Samantha Bryant. Um, I write the Menopausal Superhero series and a variety of short stories under all kinds of topics. And um, I had a new release in November in the Menopausal Superhero series. Um, it was a collection called Agents of Change that pulls together all the short work that we published earlier this year. And I'm looking forward to the fourth book, which I get to send to the publisher in January. And then we can decide what our release date is. 2022. Um, <laughs> now he promised me 2021, but yeah, that could be December 31st. I don't know. And you also are in some new collections and anthologies coming out this month too, correct? Yes. I, um, I just had one release last week called Hindsight's 2020, like, you know, apostrophe S Hindsight's 2020, which was, um, a fun collection on the, all on a theme of regret. All the stories had to be about something you regret. And I have a horror story in that one called I Should Have Known. <laughs> and then I've got another one coming out next week. It's a collection called Outsiders Within, which was on a theme of cosmic horror. And I've got my story in that one is called Margaret Lets Herself Go. Um, and uh, the self she's letting go is maybe a little more metaphysical than you might first think. <laughs> and less. And I'm Les Gould. I write in the Bubbaverse using the Lost Peterson Apostle series, um, Monster Hunter. He's new to the Monster Hunter, as uh, John puts it. He's just a veteran trying to find his way in the world and uh, finds out it's much weirder than it really is, than he's used to. Um, so I've got three novellas out. They all came out this past year, Lost Peterson Apostle, Solo Op, and Polar Protocol. You can see two of them over my head. And in November, we collected them all just in time for Christmas into beginner's luck. The uh, Monsters Are Not Myths, Volume 1. So that's out there in ebook format right now. So, Samantha, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Menopausal uh, Superhero Series. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, one of the things that, that, I mean, we all have heard, I'm tired of looking at, you know, the teens, 20s, hot bod, ready mm -hmm. to go superheroes. So what drove you to come up with superheroes, uh, with Menopausal Superheroes? Well, probably started because I was getting old, you know, <laughs> I, uh, but I, I've been a superhero fan my whole life, you know, starting with Spidey on the electric company when I couldn't even go to school yet. And um, I'd recently, when I had the idea for the Menopausal Superhero ser series, my husband and I had watched one of the X-Men movies. And I honestly don't remember which one it was now but we were walking around in our neighborhood just talking about it because we had small children at the time. The only way we got to talk to each other would be to walk the dog and take a risk leaving the kids in the living room together for a little while. Um, and in that conversation, I was telling him that I was just frustrated with all these, all these movies where it seems like the, the real message of the story is puberty causes superpowers. And I joke that if that's the case, you know, if, uh, if it's hormones that give you superpowers, then menopausal women should have the corner on that market. And uh, it, you know, the, the thought made my husband laugh and he said, you should write that down. And that was 2013 and here I am still writing it down. <laughs> so I think, I think it's an idea that stuck with me, but I, I really enjoy getting to play in superhero in different ways you know, in, in writing characters who are not footloose and fin fancy free teenagers who can just skip algebra so they can learn how to fly today, but who actually have jobs and children and partners and commitments that, um, that make uh, trying to manage powers, especially in the first book when they're new and you don't know what you're doing, 
pretty complicated. <laughs> so what about you, Les? Well, mine starts like all good stories do in a bar at Marscom. Uh, so I've uh, been trying to write. So I'm, this is actually my debut series. And I uh, got in a conversation with John telling him how I was having a hard time getting my short fiction sold. And he's like, well, you know, what? I don't have anybody writing it in Northeast. Why don't you try a Monster Hunter series purely on spec and send it to me. I'll tell you to see what I like about it. And I sent it to him. He picked up the whole series and gave me a, a three novella thing. So I uh, cranked that one out real quick. And it kind of surprised me. It's kind of fun to see how you go from beginning and you're struggling to get, it took four or five months to get the first novella written. And then you get to the third one and you write it in two months and half the time. And it's, it's been fun to see it that way. But yeah, it was, uh, it was just trying to, John's trying to give me a leg up and I've really enjoyed writing Monster Hunter. It's something I never thought I'd write. Um, I'm more science fiction is where I, I you know, where, where I liked reading fan, like high fantasy and science fiction where I read and where I dabbled in writing beforehand. And now this is a urban fantasy monster hunter series. And uh, I was surprised at how much fun I had writing it. So where'd you come up with the, uh, your main character for the monster hunter for this series? Uh, it's uh, right what you know. And I'm like, well, I grew up in New York, but I don't live there anymore. Um, I went to Virginia Military Institute for uh, college education and then made the mistake of enlisting. Um, so my main suit, my uh, main character is at the tail end of a four year enlistment in, in his military career. And he's trying to decide whether he stays in the military or leaves when he has to come home to deal with um, one of his younger brothers uh, unfortunately passed away and he's going home to bury his brother. And home is not the most pleasant of places for him because he never got along well with his father. And so he's feeling a little bit of guilt because he left his family behind. And so I, I picked up certain things for me and then added a bunch of dark elements and threw in a monster that he has to contend with. And um, so it's a little bit of what I knew and a little bit of just having fun with it. So Samantha, let's go, let's talk about the collection that just came out because it, it was all short work from this year, correct? Yes. So um, I I had an interesting publishing history in that the Menopausal Superhero series were published by a different publisher in their first iteration, and um, it's one of those cases where the the publisher just imploded, and. Um, you know, clearly they were not going to deal well with uh, people. They weren't paying people and all of that. And so I got my rights back and then re-released the series through Falstaff Books. And um, then I'm contracted to write two more books in the series because um, during all that turmoil, I had shelved writing in the series because I wasn't going to write more for a publisher that wasn't doing well by me and my work. Um, and John suggested that since it was gonna take a little while to ramp up and get me into the production schedule for that fourth book and then the fifth book, that maybe we should do some short works in the meantime to keep the series active and to keep new releases happening and keeping people interested. So we, uh, we released three of them this year. So we had uh, Friend or Foe, which is a novella that fits between book one and book two. We had, um, the Goodwill Tour, which this is one of my favorite ones. This one is a side story that you could really read completely out of context. Like it, it doesn't have to be read in any particular order with the other works, but it uh, follows two of the main characters on a hospital adventure. They're doing a Goodwill Tour to try to build up some support for the new superhero organization in the city that is a little contentious. And of course, it ends up actually being a superheroic kind of day because there's something to deal with there. And then um, there was this one through thick and thin. And this one actually has a few different short stories in it. It has um, Fly Girl's Second Chance, which is about Fly Girl's opportunity to marry again. And also about, you know, some superheroics involving a semi truck trying to fall down onto the highway below. Um, and it's got um, Underestimated, which is one of my favorite menopausal superhero stories. It's about Susie, who is not a hero, um, or not a powered hero anyway, but um, ends up being the person who manages to save the day in that story. And I liked that idea that um, sometimes even with superpowers might need help that doesn't come from superpowers. And there's a couple of other stories in here as well. And then we did uh, 
this one to pull it all together. So this is the one that just came out in November. So this takes all of those short works and puts it together into one bigger volume for a completionist and uh, maybe for people who are um, wanting to try a variety of menopausal superhero stories. And I love this cover with uh, what she did with the, she's been, um, Melissa um, MacArthur has been doing my cover art for us with Falstaff books. And on all the, on all of these, she did this thing with the stripes. And I don't have any of my novels sitting within my reach here, but all of them have cityscapes and silhouettes like this. And so for this one, she kind of combined the two elements. And I think it's one of the prettiest book covers I've ever had. Oh, they look awesome. Yeah. And they're a lot of fun read, to read. So definitely time to pick those up. So, you know, Les, working on your, uh, so you've had your collection come out. Um, let's talk a little bit about the three stories. You know, what's the overarching, you know, arc for them, you know, from going through? I mean, so obviously you've got the origin story. Yeah, so um, I took a new take on it for several reasons. Um, the, out of the above Monster, Monster Hunter universe, there's not been a lot of origin stories about someone who discovers the universe and discovers the creepy crawlies in the night. And so I'm like, oh, there's a niche I can pick up on. Plus it helps that I'm, I grew up in, I, and while I, there's certain monsters, I know like the big ones. I don't know a whole lot about monsters. I'm not really delved, uh, versed in a broad spectrum of them. So it was an opportunity for me to explore new monsters. So I'm discovering monsters about the same rate my character is. Um, and that's been kind of fun to delve into. So the whole main arc is really, it's, um, so the premise I, I threw in was because he's new. I needed someone who's experienced. So the current monster hunter for the Roman, Holy Roman Catholic Church in upstate New York and Northeast is elderly. He's actually been with the lucky ones. He's into his later age and he's getting to the point where he needs to get out of the game. He's getting a little slow on the pickup. And when he finds Matthew, who's not afraid of going toe to toe with the main werebear in the first creature in the first book, then he's like, you know, maybe this kid's got something. I need a replacement. I need to train someone. So he tries to talk Matthew into taking his job. And then in solo op, the sorry, I'm weird. In solo op, Matthew has Matthew's still in the military, so he goes back to Georgia. And then it's a different monster. Uh, one of his buddies brings it back from the desert, so he ends up fighting a different kind of monster down there all by himself without Jacob's help, the old monster hunter's help. And if you've read John's books before you know there's an organization out there a government organization called demon who's they're the, the the black ops people who take care of monsters and they come in at the very end of the book to help clean up and they're like well hey when you get out of the military give us a call so now when he finally is, is in polar protocol uh he's got two offers on the table not sure what to do and he's gone home for christmas for the first time in four years and he's still struggling with which one to go with. And Jacob draws him into yet another big monster he's got to go tackle. So it's more about him discovering the world around, the greater world around him and being slowly drawn into where he can no longer escape. He can't ignore it anymore. He's going to become more involved in the monster hunting world. So let's talk about what's coming up. Because, uh, you know, I know that these are fun books and time to pick those up in time for holidays. But so, Samantha, I'd like to say we, we know you've got a couple of more stories coming out this month. Um, so what presses did you release those couple of collections from? Let's let's uh, touch on the one that came out first, came out last week for 2020. Uh, so, hindsight. Uh, so perhaps appropriately, 2020 has ended up being a year of a lot of horror writing for me. <laughs> You know, e even though superhero has been my main niche so far, one of the things I love about a writing life is the chance to write different things. Like, you know, somebody has an idea for something I go, huh, I've never done that before. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> you know? And so uh, in that way, I ended up writing, writing and getting a lot of horror published this year. You know, back in October, I had, um, my first ever vampire story published in Slay Stories of the Vampire Noir from Mocha Memoirs Press. And then I also had a story called The Cleaning Lady um, that was published in Stories We Tell After Midnight by uh, from Crone Girls Press. And then these next two are also horror. Um, so I Should Have Known is um, in a collection called Hindsight's 2020. 
and that one's got kind of a fun um, a fun history too, in that it's a it was a collective effort from writers who had all been part of that previous publisher I mentioned, the one that imploded. So we have a recovery group to support each other from that. And we decided it would be funny to write um, a collection of stories about regret. <laughs> and, and it's all authors who didn't have a great experience with this one publisher. Um, so that's how it came about. And um, I haven't finished reading the other stories in the collection yet, but I can tell you that mine went pretty darn creepy. I was uh, a little startled myself. <laughs> I always say, I, I don't look so creepy here, but it's a little creepy in here. And then uh, that's the a last requirement thing. to be a teacher. Um. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, pro it probably helps. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the last one is going to be with a press called Abstruse Press. Um, there's a, a writer friend of mine named Dave Higgins. And I've had work included in one of his other anthologies. He had one called Fears of a Clown. And I wrote a. Um, sort of it's it plays around in the in the shallow end of Cthulhu mythos kind of stuff and in, in that story for fears of a clown you're supposed to write stories about what scares clowns and <laughs> that that's where I went for that one and so then when he had a new anthology this one's called outsiders within and he wanted cosmic horror and I I happened to have a story I had already written that fit his theme about a woman who um might be losing her mind or she might be in contact with aliens on a cosmic plane and about to cross over into another world. A little crazy one way or the other never hurts. <laughs> well and I like I like fun horror stories. I, I like stories that have a bit of ambiguity um, so that you th might think that this is going on but really this is going on. And sometimes it's great when that resolves and you find out which is which. And sometimes it's great if it doesn't resolve. And at the end, you're still not sure if something happened or if the person was just crazy, you know, kind of like Hamlet. Like, it's a great story either way, whether you, whether you read it thinking that Hamlet has lost touch with reality or if you read it thinking that he made intentional choices and there really was a ghost. So what about you, Les? What's coming up? Uh, so this uh, collection wraps up the Peterson, what I currently have under contract with Falstaff Books for Peterson Apostle. Um, but John just wrote me a new contract for a science fiction um, space opera, which I'm really excited about. So the first, this will be, with, excuse me, this will be novel length stories. So a little bit longer. Um, the first one's already done and in Falstaff's hands, I'm on contract to write uh, the next two no novels in that series over the next couple of years. So I don't have anything immediately coming out, but we should have stuff coming out soon. Um, and then we'll see if uh, 2021 allows me to return to Peterson and continue his story as well. So let's talk about the fun of writing. Cause I mean, both of you guys, we're all kind of at different positions in, in career and writing career and everything else. So, Les, from your side, how does it feel to get your first real series out the door? You know, you've had a couple other short works out as well, but how does it feel to get that first collection in your hands? You know, and what it, what you went through to go from it's an idea and somebody said, oh yeah, I'll, I'll buy off on that to now you've got three books, you've got a collection in your hands. And yeah. Uh, for me, it's it's amazing at how long it takes to get that initial break and then how fast it happens after that. Um, like I said, the science fiction series that John just picked up, I've actually been working on that since 2010, um, toying with it, tweaking it. I probably rewrote that series, the first book like four or five times in that time frame. And then the Mars con I talked with John about to get me started on Peterson, that was, uh, the 2019 Mars con. And by 2020 Mars con, we were doing the final edits on the first book in the series. So that less than a year, I went from talking with, you know, just the concept of, hey, go write it. And I'm like, all right, and I'm a pantser. So I sat down and just started, well, this happens. And then what, it just went on until I had a whole story going. And it was surprised how fast that came out. Um, and then got that in John's hands. And then you're waiting for four or five months while, you know, he's got so much other stuff to do. Your publisher has so much stuff that they're doing. For them to finally get back to you, like, oh yeah, we like this. 
are you going to do one? You want to stretch this one into a big story? You want to do three more? I'm like, no, I want to do a whole series of these novellas. And the novella length is a unique thing. I didn't, I never wrote novellas before. I wrote longer stories and to pull out a novella was a lot of fun. Um, and so then you go from that to six months later, I've, we're in the middle of editing book one. I'm still finishing. I just finished up book two and I'm in the middle of writing book three all at the same time. And you went from taking your time with no deadlines to, I got a lot of deadlines all at once. <laughs> and then at the end of the year, I've got three novellas, which are nice, you know, the quick reads by themselves, or you got a big collection, which I can't wait to hold in my hands. Um, a big collection that's a full length you know, novel that people are going to be able to enjoy. And I'm finally starting to get those reviews to coming back in that make me like, oh, yes, people are actually reading it and they like it. Isn't it the yeah. best that when you first get reviews and you have no idea who that person is, like they're not even connected to you, like friend of a friend. It's a complete stranger who found your book, even if they hated it. It's still so exciting that okay. they found your book and it feels so real. <laughs> it's awesome. And then uh, because my character is in the military a little bit, and I, I have some military experience, but not, I, I never served active duty. I was a reservist. Um, and then I had a first sergeant, a retired first sergeant post. Unfortunately, he didn't post as a review to my book, but a response to one of my ads. Um, but he's like, I went into this thinking I was going to tear it up. And you nailed every bit of the military side of it. I was like, yes. <laughs> So that's a fun side is to get feedback and, and to have people come back to you. So Samantha, you know, your, your superheroes have been out there for a while. So, you know, how's it feel to know you've still got, you've still got some more time to spend with these characters before you get to, you know, put them out to pasture. I tell you what I, what I really need is additional time because, um, you know, I, I'm a part-time writer. I'm a, I'm a full-time school teacher and I, you know, and I also have a family and responsibilities. So during, at least during school days, I can pretty much only give my writing life two hours a day. And that's for handling all the business of it and for creating. And it's wonderful to be in a position where you know you've got a likely publisher for your work. You know, because I'm already contracted for these books, even if um, Falstaff Books isn't 100% pleased with the first draft that I send in, they're going to work with me and, you know, at worst, we'll uh, push back the um, release date to get the best quality work that we can. And that's a wonderful position to be in, you know, knowing that somebody's waiting on my work. It's also a terrible position to be in sometimes because... It means you have deadlines to meet, and so you must write this, even if part of you would like to be writing this right now. And that's kind of what happened to me with the most recent novel. I and mean, once I shifted gears, I fell right back in with the characters and had a great time again. And I think Be the Change is going to be the best book of the series so far. Um, and of course, I still love all of them. But um, but I had been writing a gothic romance um, and I was having a great time and I was trying to finish that one before I had to switch gears, but I couldn't, I you know, just with the amount of time I had. So I had to shelve this unfinished book and jump to work on another one. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to do that and also frustrated by that. <laughs> Shiny objects. It's Yes. It, there, there will never be a shortage of ideas. There will never be a shortage of books. Right. That we and, don't get you know, to. and like I said, part of the fun for me is writing a lot of different things. So as much as I love my menopausal superheroes, I don't intend to be a one trick pony. And that's all that I ever write is that series. I have a lot of stories that are half told in my brain and in my hard drive that I would like to finish <laughs> and get out there into the world. Yeah, I've got a number of those, and I've got some that will never see the light of day, come hell or high water. Well, the very <laughs> first book I, I ever finished writing is not published. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the best ways to learn how to write a book is by writing a book. But you were learning, so it's not a great book, the first one for most people. And I'm sure there are some uh, people out there who the first thing they wrote was absolute genius, but I am not that person. So for somebody that's just wanting to get started as a writer, what would you want to tell them? I mean, that is getting started in the process, 
you know, usually the first thing I say is if you've got anything else you want to do creatively, go do that. If you cannot help but to be a writer, be a writer. So what's, what advice would you have for somebody that's trying to get into it? They may have the first 12 you know, novels that they've written sitting under the bed, hidden away so that they'll never, ever see the light of day. But they're working on lucky number 13. Um, you know, what would you tell somebody that's, that is just trying to get that push out the door to really start pushing and showing their work? Do you want to go first? No, I was going to ask, you want to handle that first? You want me to? Um, having the fact that I just broke in, I mean, I, my debut is this whole year. Um, for me, the big thing that helped me get my work out the door and into print was going to conventions, which I know is something hard to say right now because so many of them are unfortunately canceled and postponing. Um, but they will come back and they will be there. And when you can get out in front and meet other writers, meet other publishers, meet other people in the industry, you know, continual dive into all the videos that are on continual and, and connect with people because those connections are what's going to one, they're going to encourage you to keep writing. They're going to help you write better. Um, you can bounce ideas off them and you're going to meet publishers and other, and you're going to find out about those resources that are out there and places to send your work. Cause um, I haven't heard of half of the places that Samantha said she's got these publishers that are putting out her little anthologies. That's great. I mean, th this is something I'm going to go back and try to research some of these places, like try to get some little short works out into anthologies. Um, and that's connecting with people is probably one of the things if you're already writing on a daily basis. If you're not writing and you need to write, write. And then also read. I mean, it's, it's, it takes up so much of your time, but it, it should always be enjoyable at this point when you're don't have any deadlines, you don't have any contracts, it needs to be enjoyable the whole time. It should never feel like a big burden, at least that's the way I look at it. So. If you don't hate the manuscript, you haven't spent enough time with it yet. <laughs> well, I, I finish I, it. I would say there's a lot of writers who like having written yes. <laughs> better than they like writing. And it is painful sometimes in the process. You're beating your head against a wall trying to figure out what's wrong and why this won't move forward. But I think Les is very right that um, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to develop a community around yourself of writers. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. I'm, I'm a fairly introverted person. Um, and so things like just walking up to authors at conventions and talking to them was not gonna work for me. But, <laughs> but what I could do was like join a professional organization and attend their events. I, I would go to conventions and I would sit in on the panels and take notes and then maybe I'd get up the guts to ask a question in that kind of setting in a um, more formalized setting was easier mm -hmm. for me when I was trying to, you know, get out there and network a little bit. And there's a range of networks that are really useful to um, people trying to build a writing career. Like I said, there's professional organizations like I joined the Women's Fiction Writers Association. Um, I'm in one now called superherofiction.com. <laughs> I've been in one called the Pen and Cape Society, you know, and, you know, there's various things I've gotten from all of these, but there's also like my critique group, which is just, you know, a group of writers who happen to come into my life and a range of experience from writing their first novel ever and multi-published all in the same group. And we all learn from each other. So, and, and you can find things like that online too, if you live someplace where it's hard to get, hard to get that live because you live someplace really small or, um, or because, you know, everybody's staying home for a while as they should and only going out with mask on as they should, um, <laughs> then, you know, if you can get a lot of this kind of stuff or at least some semblance of it online too. And uh, keep an open ear and because there's a million ways to do it wrong there's a million ways to do it right and what worked for one author is not going to work specifically for every author and so you got to kind of be open to kind of absorb it all and let it work its way into your own process and you'll find your way through it i think a lot of people are looking for a magic bullet they want to be like okay tell me what you did i'll do exactly that it's not going to work you know, whatever, whatever worked was six years ago in that moment. And now that moment's gone and you can't do that anymore. And it worked for a teacher who only had two hours in a day to write. Right. I'm an engineer. I wrote most of these books in a subway 
during lunch break. <laughs> so. Right, versus somebody who maybe has the, the freedom to kind of build their life around their writing yes. because you know they're retired or they have some other source of income for support. Well, you know, and I've used this bad line teaching workshops before, but there is no silver bullet to business, even if you're writing horror, you know, because you're exactly right. Just because it works for one person doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And the hard lesson is even if it works for you now, doesn't mean it's going to work for you in three months, six months, or even a year. Uh, you know, when you're working with your ads, when you're working with things like that online, algorithms change, the rules change. Well, I find that true, not even just on the selling books end, but on the writing books end, mm -hmm. that every book is its own problem that you're going to solve. And just because you've succeeded in writing a book before doesn't mean that you know exactly how to write this one. There's going to be new problems to it, yeah. um, even if it's in the same series with some of the same characters. I've written myself in a hole before, yes. Um <laughs> <laughs> So is there any last tidbits you guys want to give to uh, aspiring writers or readers that just can't help but pick up your books? Enjoy it. I mean, life's too short not to enjoy what you're doing. I'd second that. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's all about the fun and you should enjoy what you're reading and you should enjoy what you're creating. It could be hectic, but enjoy it. <laughs> until you're editing it, which point you can hate it, but you still got oh, to yeah, yeah, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tear it up. Then you, then you can it. enjoy having edited yes. <laughs> afterwards when you celebrate. Well, guys, I appreciate you joining us for an episode of Hot Off the Press. So if you guys want to let everybody know where we can find you, Samantha, I'll let you go first. All right. So my website is samanthabryant.com. I know, so creative. But, you know, if you know my name, then you can find me. Um, and on social media, um, I commonly use at Samantha B writer. That's just the letter B in the middle. I thought it was kind of punny and plus it's also my initial. So <laughs> Samantha B writer on Instagram and Twitter and on Facebook, I'm Samantha Dunaway Bryant because there was another Samantha Bryant already. <laughs> and Les? Uh, on social media, you can find me as Les Gould Wright. Um, that's, I use the same one across Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. Uh, as far as you can find my works, obviously at Falstaff, my publisher, or you can go to uh, Amazon. It's got all of them available in ebook and paperback format. So go check them out. Sign up for my newsletter. Sign up for Samantha's newsletter. You can find that at my website at lesgould.com uh, or Samantha's website, I'm sure. Yes. I was say, Samantha, <laughs> the newsletter's bar, on right you. there. <laughs> And I'm Jim Nettles. You can find me at jamespnettles.com. You can find me at authoressentials.net. And of course, here at Continual Convention. And of course, if you like what you're seeing in here, you know, we want you to you know, subscribe to the channel, follow us, and of course, share and let everybody know what you're hearing and seeing. We appreciate it. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.